dy dx. Okay? And by the anti-symmetry, this becomes minus the same thing if we replace k by its transpose, k of yx. And now we're going to do to something totally stupid. We're going to use the fact that y and x are dummy variables so we can just interchange their rules because this truncation is symmetric with respect to x and y. So this is the same as minus integral where x minus y is bigger than epsilon, k of x, y now, but now we have f of x and g of y. Okay? And now this is equal to this, which means it's equal to the, to the average of the two. Okay, so this is the same as one-half integral where x minus y is bigger than epsilon k of x, y times f of y g of x minus f of x g of y dy dx. Okay, and now I'm going to Take absolute values. All right. And I'm going to bring an absolute value all the way in. And when I do that, I'm just going to crudely integrate over all of Rn cross Rn. And I'm going to use the Calderon Zygmunt size condition. So up to a constant, this is 1 over x minus y to the n. And then here, I'm going to subtract off and add back in f of x times g of x. OK? So this first pairing, what do I pick up? I pick up this first pairing, I pick up y minus x times the L infinity norm of grad f times the L infinity norm of, of g. And then from this second pair, I pick up the same thing, but with the roles of f and g interchange. Except, actually, before I do that, I want to do one other thing. Each of these is supported in a ball centered at x naught of radius r. OK? So when I integrate in, let's say, x, I have x naught minus x less than r. And I also have, just by the triangle inequality, x minus y less than 2r. OK? And I put all that together. All of this stuff pulls out. I would notice what happens that I've weakened the singularity by order one. Now it becomes an integrable singularity. And when you integrate in y, you pick up a factor of r. When you integrate it in x, you pick up r to the n. So this is less than or equal to r to the n times r times grad f infinity g infinity plus the same thing where the roles of f and g interchanged. OK? And that's weak boundedness. OK? So weak boundedness is just, should think of it actually as a cancellation condition. There's some weak cancellation implicit in this anti-symmetry. In fact, if we had a convolution kernel, that, that anti-symmetry would be, in and of itself, enough cancellation to give you L2 boundedness. All right, but we're in the non-cancellation, non-convolution case, so we need a little bit more. OK. 
So maybe one more comment is in order. Uh, remember the examples that I gave you. Um, the Cauchy integral and Lipschitz curve, the, um, the Calderon commutators. What you notice is that they actually do satisfy this anti-symmetry condition, okay? If you just interchange the rules of x and y, all you do is introduce a minus sign. So that's worth remarking. Right, the Cauchy integral and Lipschitz curve, uh, the colorable commutators associated to a Lipschitz function have anti-symmetric kernels. Okay, so that we can make sense of their principal values in this way. And in fact, the associated principal value operator satisfies the weak boundaries property. Okay, oh, about that, maybe I should make a comment. Why does this give you existence of the principal values? It's just dominated convergence, right? Because you can put absolute values in. Right? It says the limit exists. Okay, so now, Another theorem, which in a way can be thought of as kind of a converse to the T of one theorem, a strong converse, um, but actually much easier and preceded it by a number of years. There's a theorem due independently to Petrie, to Span, and to Stein. They all found this theorem independently around the same time. And it says the following thing. Suppose that we have a calderon Zygmunt operator that we know is bounded on NL2. Then T maps L infinity to BMO, okay? calderon Zygmunt operators are typically not bounded at the, at the endpoints, right? They're bounded on, I mean, what you typically hope to find anyway, is that once you get L2 boundedness, you get LP boundedness, but you don't get L infinity boundedness, nor do you get L1 boundedness. You get weak type 1, 1, and this is the naturally associated endpoint result in infinity. Okay, and just a comment, of course, just basic Hilbert space theory tells you that if T is bounded on L2, then so is T star, and so then also T star maps L infinity to BMO. Okay? All right. So let's see why this is true. Okay. All right, so there's one sort of technical issue is for calderon zygmunt operators, right, we originally have defined them as mappings from test functions to distribution. So they're well defined on C0 infinity. Once you know it's bounded on NL2, then it, right, it makes the operator make sense on elements of L2, but how do we make sense of it in L infinity? So we have to interpret, okay, so for F in L infinity, we have to interpret T of F modulo constants. Okay, and this makes sense after all because we're, we're trying to show that maps into BMO. BMO is only defined modulo constants, so, so this is natural, okay? All right, so we need to show that the BMO norm of T of F is bounded, all right? So let F be an L infinity, and we fix a cube Q, okay? And we need to consider this. Okay, at least formally, Tf of x minus Cq 
okay, where, if, all right, I've kind of glossed over the definition of this, but it'll kind of become apparent as we go through the arguments, okay, what we're doing here, all right? All right, we need to show that for, is that there exists a constant, depending on Q, such that this is bounded by some uniform constant times the Allen theory norm of that. Okay? All right. Okay. So then we're going to split F into two pieces. F is going to be F1 plus F2, where F1 is F times the indicator of, let's say, 5 times the Q. That's the concentric dilate. And so F2 is obviously living on the complement of 5Q. All right? And so the mean value on Q of Tf of x minus Cq is going to be less than or equal to the mean value of Q of T of F1 plus mean value of Q Tf2 minus Cq. Now this is perfectly well defined because T is about an operator in L2 and the, once we've truncated this to have compact support, F1 is in L2. So this makes sense. This we'll need to make sense of. All right? All right, so what about the first term? Let's call it, give these a name, 1 plus 2. Okay? All right, term 1 is going to be easy. We're going to just use L2 boundedness which we know by hypothesis. Okay, so term one, by Cauchy-Schwartz, this is less than or equal to the average, the L2 average. And now we use that T is bounded on L2. At this point, just integrate over all of Rn. This will be less than or equal to the L2 operator norm of T. We'll have 1 over the measure of Q. Then we'll pick up the L2 norm of F1, but F1, remember, is truncated to live in 5Q. So up to a constant, we're just taking an average of this L infinity function. Of course, that's controlled by the L infinity norm. OK? Which is the bound we want for that term. All right? So what about the bound for term two? For term two, now this is where we have to make sense of what we mean here. So what we mean is that, okay, so first I have to tell you what CQ is. So CQ is going to be T of F2 evaluated at XQ, which is the center of Q. And of course that doesn't necessarily really make sense either, but in conjunction, we make sense of them. All right? Okay. So then for x in q, Tf2 of x minus Tf2 of xq. What we mean by this is that this is really, we think of it this way. This is really the kernel for, for T, k of xy evaluated at x and y minus the value at xq and y. And then that's integrated against F2. And this makes sense because of the Calderon Zygmunt smoothness condition. All right, this is going to be a lesson. We bring absolute values in, use the Calderon Zygmunt smoothness condition. We're going to have um, x minus xq to some positive power alpha divided by x minus y to the power n plus alpha. And here, then, we're integrating Right, the picture is this. 
x is in the cube q, y is outside 5 times q. So the distance from x to y is always bigger than some constant times the length of q. So we're integrating where x minus y because of the truncation of f2. We're integrating where x minus y is bigger than a constant times the length of q. On the other hand, x is in q, so x minus xq is bounded by a constant times the length of q. And then we just pull out the L infinity norm. All right? And this just integrates to give you some constant depends on n and alpha. OK? So that's actually a pointwise bound for this thing. And then you integrate it. You take its average over q. Since it's pointwise bounded, then the average is also bound by the same thing, and you're done. OK? All right. And I guess that's a good place to stop. We're out of time. Thanks for your attention again. Any questions? Any questions today? Okay, we'll have fun at the problem session. <laughs> See you Thursday. <laughs>